The Eagle Among the Prophets. A man called Isaiah. Have you heard this verse before? Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. There's a famous story connected with that verse from Isaiah. It happened in 1850 in January when it was very snowy, and a 15-year-old boy set out for church. He arrived at a Methodist chapel where there were just 13 people. That was not the church he meant to reach, but the weather was too bad, and the preacher never turned up. So a deacon stood in for him, and he'd finish speaking in just ten minutes. But he took this as his text: Isaiah chapter forty-five, verse twenty-two. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. And the deacon said to the teenager, "Young man, you look very miserable this morning." You need to look to Jesus and be saved, young man. Look, look to Jesus, and that teenager did, and Jesus came into his heart, forgave his sins. Do you know who he was? He was Charles Spurgeon, who later became the Prince of Preachers amongst the Baptists. Well, we're looking at the ministry of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. One responsibility of Old Testament prophets who had access to kings was to warn their fellow Israelites about the pitfalls of entering into unholy alliances with foreign nations. Now, this was not an issue of xenophobia or racism, but of false religions, idol worship, and immorality. In pagan societies, would weaken the people of God and draw them away from the Holy One of Israel. We're going to learn today of a great deliverance for the people of God. The date: seven hundred and one B.C. And there was a new king on the throne of Judah, a king called Hezekiah. He got off to a good start. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He cleansed the temple and he stopped the idolatry that the evil king Ahaz had encouraged. Hezekiah was a religious reformer. Now, in seven hundred and one, he was thirty-nine, and the mighty power of Assyria could no longer be held at bay. They were interested in a land grab. And they were led by a fearsome man called Sennacherib, and he now was just outside the walls of Jerusalem. In fact, if people wanted to frighten their children, they used to say, "Sennacherib will get you." He was a dreadful enemy, and every garrison town protecting Jerusalem had been overrun by Assyrian troops. This was not just an assault on the holy city, Jerusalem, but it was a bare-faced, full frontal attack on faith in God, surrounded by a hostile foreign army. The might of Assyria, the outlook was exceedingly bleak. But good King Hezekiah's response was to take it to the Lord in prayer. He went to the temple of the Lord. And he sent for the prophet Isaiah. He needed to hear from God, and Isaiah doesn't let him down. In chapter thirty-seven, verses six and seven, this is what the Lord says: Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen. I am going to put a spirit in him, so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. 
Hezekiah's prayer in the temple was short but impassioned. It's in chapter 37 from verse 16. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these peoples and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And that's what happened. God wonderfully intervened. When the Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in scarlet and gold, God dramatically halted his proud advance. Sennacherib's army did not enter Jerusalem. Not a single arrow was fired. Here's the amazing account in Isaiah 37 verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. The result? Just as Isaiah had foretold, Sennacherib broke camp. He withdrew and returned to his capital, Nineveh. And one day, years later, while worshipping in the temple of his pagan god Nisroch, his two sons cut him down with the sword. You know, the Old Testament is not fairy tales, but historical events that really happened. The great king, the king of Assyria, looks very little when he's forced to return in terror and fear to his own country lest the angel who had destroyed his army should destroy him. God, not Sennacherib, is worthy to be called the great king. Jerusalem, not Nineveh, is the city of the great king. And God still intervenes in the lives of individuals and of nations. God loves to break in to the dark places and scatter the darkness with his glorious light. I read the testimony of an Irish woman called Violet McGrath. By the time she was a teenager, both her parents were dead. At 15, she saw the light. She was converted to Christ in the Albert Hall on the Shankill Road in Belfast, and God called her to be a missionary not to her own people, which is what happened to Isaiah, but to the Japanese. And Violet began to live by faith. She joined the Japan Rescue Mission. At that time in Japan, girls could be sold by their parents for immoral purposes, and she rescued over a thousand girls from a life of degradation and prostitution. She used to visit Osaka prison to lead the men to Christ, and some saw the light. A Japanese woman, whose family had been Buddhists for generations, became her co-worker. She'd known nothing of the gospel and the Christian religion before, but at 18, this Japanese girl, called Oya, first heard about Jesus. She'd walked in darkness all her life, but now she saw a great light. And Violet and Oya did a lasting work for God in pre-war Japan. Afterwards, Violet became a Bible college lecturer, teaching young Christian students the great truths 
in the word of God. And the great truth that Isaiah is declaring to his generation is the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. His message is one of hope and joy. He proclaims more clearly than any other prophet the coming of the Messiah. Has his voice of hope reached down the years to your ears? Do you know that there is a Redeemer? Have you seen a great light?